So very good afternoon to all of you, our cherished viewers of Hot Issues on TV3. And welcome to another exciting and insightful edition of your favorite program. So lots of you have been talking about, you know, the free SHS policy ever since the president, Nana Kufuado, talked about implementing it from the 2017-2018 academic year. Where would the money come from? Well, we've heard from the senior minister, and he says the money will be coming from the Heritage Fund. And that in itself has generated a lot of controversy. What is wrong with using the Heritage Fund to fund the free SHS policy? And my guest for this afternoon is campaigns coordinator for the Integrated Social Development Center, ISODEC, Dr. Steve Manteo. Good afternoon, Doc, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank I believe you're doing me. very well. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm doing Good. very well. Good. So, first and foremost, what's the use of the Heritage Fund? Why was the Heritage Fund created in the first place? Thank you very much. I think it's good we're starting on this note mm -hmm. because getting the, a very firm understanding of the historical antecedent mm -hmm. of the establishment of the yeah. Heritage Fund is important to appreciate why some of us are against the use of the fund to finance the free SHS program of the government. Um, it is a case that this country has been mining gold for well over 100 years. And eventually, in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000, we ended up as a highly indebted poor country, mm. which for me speaks volumes of how badly we've mismanaged our gold revenues. Indeed, we treated our gold revenues as income for consumption and nothing for savings. So we will take a whole year's revenue from gold and put it into the next year's budget mm. and spend everything, often on recurrent expenditure items. And let me say that education financing is a recurrent expenditure. Okay, we definitely and would come back. That is what we've done. Mm -hmm. And so, after 100 years of mining, this country has nothing to show for it. So when in 2007, we were blessed with hydrocarbons, that's oil and gas, mm. The government of the day, which happens to have, uh, have been an NPP government um, under former President Kufo, decided that we will take every step to avoid the mistakes we have made in the mining sector. Mm. And so we are going to move away from the practice of spending all our natural resource revenue in a, in a given year and waiting for the next years to come so we spend it. Mm. And so in 2008, the government of the day organized a first ever oil for development conference in Ghana with the support of the country's development partners. Um, in 2009, we went through a political transition. At the time, the discussions around um, the law to manage how we spend petroleum revenues in this country had not been completed. And so the NDC government inherited that particular process. Mm. The good thing about what the NDC did is that they did not change the lead person who was helping to put together a framework for managing petroleum revenues in this country, who happened to have been uh, Professor Joe Amwaku Tofuo. Okay. So Professor Joe Amwaku Tofuo worked under two political dispensations, MPP government and NDC government, and stayed the course. And the result was the Petroleum Revenue Management Act that we have today. It is important to know that our arrangements embedded in this act mm -hmm. is touted as the best practice all over the world. In fact, you can find our arrangement in only East Timor. Okay. Of course, some countries had gone ahead of us. As like, in having uh, a heritage fund? Yes, a heritage fund and also... Um, a stabilization fund and having elaborate transparency, transparency provisions in the act. Mm. It's a, it's a world-class law that we have. Now, let me point out the fact that agreeing to establish a, a, a heritage fund that puts away 9% of net petroleum revenues moves Ghana away from the reckless practice of spending all our natural resource revenue in a given year mm. and putting something aside for a rainy day. Okay. In the law, we say for future generations. Mm. 
let me explain that the reference to future generations in the law, it is not to people born today. It is not referring to the babies of today. It is referring to a generation that may not be lucky to meet our oil and gas endowment. That generation may be born at a time when we have depleted all our oil and gas resources. But at least, if for nothing at all, they will meet remnants of our oil endowment in the form of a fund that has been put aside for them. Is this still relevant today? That we it go is, according to the uh, dictates of the law? It is very, very relevant. If it were not, we have spent about 2.9 billion Ghana cities of oil revenue since 2011. And the question I ask yourself is that, can you point to anything at all in this economy that tells you that this is how we have used the money? You can't point to the uh, gas processing plant? The gas processing plant was put together through a loan, a one billion loan And being serviced by the oil revenue. We have not even started paying yet we because- We to service it We with are to service yes. it with oil revenue. Good. But we are unable to collect electricity tariffs that will go to service Being unable to collect doesn't mean we wouldn't use that to service it. But what would you prefer? Are you suggesting that you would want an uneducated public to give birth to this incoming generation for them to suffer? Um, let me say that I and my organization mm -hmm. wholly support the decision to make secondary school education accessible to everybody. Okay. And I, as a person, use my life as an example. I come from a very humble background. Throughout my education, I've been on scholarship. Having been to secondary school and completed, I got another scholarship to go and further Is that another more reason why we should use these funds to support the current generation, to ensure that the incoming generation would also be taken care of, and in this case, they would have been born by educated people? I am concerned about the sustainability of the mode of financing that we are looking at currently. What's the concern? The concern is that we don't have anything more than 300 million in the Heritage Fund. In fact, that's, we have that's in dollars, 300 million dollars. 300, 300 million yes. dollars. The last time I checked, I think it was, as of 2016, it was 268 million dollars. Mm -hmm. So you estimate it today at 300 million dollars. That translates into 1.2 billion mm -hmm. Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. Estimates suggest that we need about 3.6 billion Ghana cities to finance this. Who's estimates? Well, um, there have been a number of estimates. This is coming from um, the education sector, or uh, um, what you call officials. Um, Imani estimates that we we'll need about $600 million every year. And so there are many estimates being bandied about. And if I go from what I... Uh, I do not see that. In, in, hold on one minute on yeah. all of these estimates. How much do senior high schools pay now? Um, I, can, I, I cannot give I, you the I, I would I will tell you, I will tell right. you because, uh, yeah. I mean, I know they have about 750 Ghana cities. You, you, multiplied you by in, three. For day students boarders. or for, for boarders? Boarding, But yes. what we're talking about includes day students. Oh, yeah, hold on. For, so boarding, yeah. and I'm, no, I'm, I'm giving the population in the senior high schools. All right. So we have a boarding and a day student population of over 400,000 people in the senior high schools. I think it's estimated as 800,000. 400,000 in senior high schools. You, senior high schools. Okay, yes, right, so you if you have 400,000 in the senior high schools. Right. Okay. Then you go to 2,000, about 2,100 per annum on them, per their school fees right. and everything. If you multiply that, that would give you 800 million Ghana cities. Right. Even if we go for what you're talking about, right. 800,000, that's 1.6 billion Ghana cities. Right. So... What's wrong with that? 1.6. That means you are exhausting the amount of money mm -hmm. that has been accumulated in the Heritage Fund over six years in one year. That is the cause for concern. Why is that a cause for concern? Because it raises serious questions about sustainability. Where are you going to take the money from the following year to sustain the free SHS? There will be some uh, Heritage Fund also, and other sources can be used to help. What will accrue to the Heritage Fund will be not, not uh, more than 20 million on a yearly basis. And so compare that to what you require to sustain the initiative. 
We have other oil wells coming in. Oil wells coming in? Yes, we have other, I mean, we are, we are, we are anticipating other revenue from the oil. But then you will not, it, the heritage fund stream alone will not actually be enough to, to take care of your educational expenditure. Some have said that could take uh, care of a annual. three years. I mean, some have said that could take care of a three year period. Now, if that, is, well, if that was to take care of a three year period, within that period also, you'd have the heritage fund accruing, another fund accruing. So, over the period, once so it's you done, are not allowing the it. fund to accrue because every year you are dipping your hands into it. That's for investment. No, you you're are investing in the human resource, Dr. Manteo. You've it, talked it, about it. Why don't you invest in it? You see, you see, the point we are missing here is that. The arrangement embedded mm -hmm. in the Petroleum Revenue Management mm -hmm. Act allows you mm -hmm. access to 70% mm -hmm. of the net revenue from the sector. If the 70% is not enough to take care of your priorities, what will 9% do for you? So that is what we should be paying attention to. And I'll tell you that, look, the 70% available for spending through the budget, that's the annual budget funding amount, is being abused. Last How's year been, in 2016. How has it been abused? Last year in 2016, mm -hmm. the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, on which I serve, mm -hmm. went on a fact finding mission to the north. To our dismay, we discovered that in Tamale, for instance, a school building, a six unit classroom block that was supposed to be built with oil revenue, that's the Farikia Islamic School, was, in, was non existent. Went to somewhere around Jirapa, Duri Dam. Monies were allocated way back in 2014 for some construction works on the dam. The money has gone. The project has not been executed. Come to Wa Central, Nakori Dam. Monies were disbursed for some tunneling works on that dam. Monies have gone. Tunneling works not done. And there are lots of them. Road constructions that mm -hmm. have not been executed but have been budgeted for. And monies from the oil resources have been allocated to. Who budgeted and allocated these funds? Well, it was the previous government. And I'm saying that that is where we need to look at. We need so to the, actually so be issue, able to identify mm -hmm. the loopholes, plug them, and raise the needed money to finance education and leave the heritage fund alone. The current generation is being greedy. You are not able to take good care of your 70%. The current generation is ensuring that the incoming generation would have an educated population, a skilled population. The incoming generation mm -hmm. has a stake. In the 70%, the children born today have a stake in the 70% that the PRMA, the Petroleum Revenue Management Law, allows us to spend today. Dr. Mantiao, why are you fighting for something that is non-existent? Here we are today. Yeah. We are faced with a need. Why don't we address it with the funds that we have, rather than say, okay, so let's wait for the incoming generation to come and use these funds when the need is now? That is reckless. How does that constitute recklessness? Is it, there is a need today, and that, that need must the be The NDC government mm -hmm. knew very well about the existence of the Heritage Fund. And yet, when we went into difficulty, they went to the IMF to borrow. You see, if you turn your eye onto something you are putting aside against a rainy day, at the least difficulty, then you are not being responsible enough. And if that has to be the case, that anybody at all can just rule this country. But we, are, we, we, we vote for leaders because we want them to think outside the box, to find innovative solutions out of difficult situations. Is it not innovative to use the, I mean, the Heritage Fund because there's a need and you have that money? Why do you go and borrow monies at 10% and more when you have money that is accruing only a percentage interest? Somebody accumulated that fund. No, hold on, hold on. Which is better? You have money that accrues a percentage interest and then going to borrow at 10% in interest per annum, which you're paying over, say, a 10-year period. Meanwhile, your money is there and generates 1% per annum, yeah, the, the, which is reckless. Your money is there for a purpose. If it were the case that we are borrowing against the uh, heritage fund and that or even we are we are, we're taking the heritage fund but as, 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 as a loan mm -hmm. to be returned, to be repaid with interest, I'll have no problem against it. Mm. But if you are taking the money to spend today, so that tomorrow we'll have no fund, I'm worried. Is education important? Education is very, very important. Does it transform an economy? It does. 
at least it informs voters when they go to the polls to make choices. Does it make the economy better? It does, because it translates into skilled workforce. So if it, if it translates into skilled workforce, why can't we invest in it, irrespective of the future uh, repercussions? Invest in it, yes. but do that through taxes. So which taxes should be introduced, Dr. Mantel? Um, I do not suggest that we introduce new taxes, hmm. but we need to find space within our tax revenue to finance free SHS. Help me find that space. I will give you some data. Go ahead. Uganda mm -hmm. was the first country in Africa to introduce free SHS. At the time Uganda introduced free SHS, the whole economy of Uganda was worth 12 billion US dollars. In the year that Ghana is contemplating the introduction of free SHS, the economy of Ghana is worth 37 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. Uganda did this program through tax revenue. Somebody has been able to tax 12 billion GDP to finance free SHS. Why can't you tax 37 billion GDP to do the same? There are too many leakages in our tax administration. That is what I find uh, through work that we've done in, in, the, in, the, in the last couple of years. Um, not too long ago, Sometime in 2014, we sat down and looked on and lost up to 70 million US dollars in potential tax revenue. And I'm here referring to the non payment of capital gain tax by the EO Group and by Saba Oil when they sold their stake in Jubilee. Mm. You know, we, had, we have a petroleum income tax law that is silent on the payment of capital gain tax. But in the provisions of the general income tax law, there is express mention of capital gain tax. And experts will tell you that where you have a sector-specific law, and that sector-specific law is silent on a particular tax, it can be interpreted as exemption. Mm. So EO Group sold their stake. I raised the alarm. Nobody took notice. In fact, the then... Uh, Minister for uh, Energy and Petroleum, Dr. Otieji, assured us that we'll be able to tax that transaction, but we were not able to do so. So rationally, one would expect that we'll close the loophole. We did not do that. We sat down for another one year, then Seba Oil also sold his stake in Jubilee and also refused to pay capital gain tax. They are gone now. Between the two transactions, mm -hmm. we, le we, we lost 70 million US dollars. So these transactions are gone now? Yes. And just recently, mm -hmm. I've been working on transfer pricing issues in the gas sector. Okay. And some information I came by and shared with the GRA has led to the recovery of $10 million in unpaid taxes and penalties. Mm. So I'm saying that there is a problem with our tax administration. So much money is being leaked and we need to address these ones so, in order to conserve money to finance our free SHS. So what's the point? No new taxes, but block the leakages? Block the leakages. In fact, another study that was mm -hmm. conducted by ISODEC and the Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition revealed that a quarter of budgetary allocation to the education sector never arrived at their destination. Where do they go? They, got mis they get missing in the value chain. Missing and along Well, through corruption and misappropriation. People are ripping the state of and you believe these monies can be used to fund the free SHS? My brother, if we were to do an audit, a forensic audit of a GET fund, I guess we'll be amazed to find out how much money has been abused and misused in that fund. How long did it take you to do all these studies you're talking about? We've been working on tax issues at ISODEC for the past five years as part of our budget work. And based on that, you came up with these uh, Yes, it's like Ghana is losing huge sums of money through illicit financial outflows. And this we need to check. Otherwise, no matter what you do, you will not be able to sustain, okay, the financing of free SHS. We need to start free SHS in the next seven, eight months. Where sure. do we get the money from? Go to the ABFA. That is 70% 70, 70 of net petroleum um, um, revenues. It's much bigger than the 9% that we Road and other infrastructure. Country. Sorry? They're supposed to be used on roads and other infrastructure. Yes, it's a prioritization issue. Yes, so the prioritization is there now. You, you're telling me education is the most important thing for mm -hmm. uh, development, isn't it? Yes. So fine. If you think education is that important, you may want to decide to spend half 
of the ABF. Well, they're talking about a medium-term framework, Dr. Mantel. Yeah. We're talking about a medium-term framework right. here. And the Minister of Finance will decide that medium-term framework. Right. And the medium-term, they've decided, we decided that we are spending the monies on uh, roads and other infrastructure, a great modernization, amortization of loans for oil and gas projects, and then capacity building. Right? Yes. Good. And the capacity building, we are looking at those within the oil and gas sector. So that would call for a change or a shift in the policy again. The finance minister would then have to come back and say this. Now, if that would call for a shift, why can't we also just call for a shift in the heritage fund and say, you know what, we want to have an educated population. Like you said, we want to have a population that is skilled because, mind you, you have the free SHS talking about getting, you know, covering vocational and technical training as well as agricultural training. What is wrong if we take a $300 million, fetching us a 1% in, in, uh, you know, uh, interest, 1 interest, pump it into education, then we are certain that we are on the right track. And what is wrong with allocating about three times the $300 million from the ABFA to finance education? Are you suggesting we don't need infrastructure development? It's a prioritization. The previous government are you said... No, but are you suggesting we don't need infrastructure development? We need. So if we need infrastructure so development, it's, it's, sh 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 should we forfeit the infrastructure development for education, you for do, free SHS? You, you do not forfeit the infrastructure development. So if we do not forfeit infrastructure development, yeah. can we then keep the infrastructure development and so we are going for money elsewhere for free SHS? Yes, you can do that. Where so would the, that money the, come the from? The way you do this mm -hmm. is to allocate them in proportions. Mm -hmm. Okay? The previous government felt that infrastructure was more important than anything else. So it decided that it was going to make infrastructure financing through the Petroleum ABFA, a permanent feature. So it established the uh, Ghana Infrastructure Fund using the ABFA, 25% of it, as a feedstock for raising the needed financing for infrastructure. We can do the same for, for education. If we think education is that important, we can decide that we want to put 30%, 40%, 50% of the ABFA into education and the rest distributed between infrastructure, agriculture, and whatever, whatever we, we decide. Should we cut funding to the GNPC? No, we should not. We should actually find a more convenient way of financing GNPC. What I've always that, said that... What would be that convenient way? That convenient way would be to give GNPC some seed money and allow it to go fend for itself. So that it Haven't we have given them enough? What is enough? Enough will be when GMPC has been allowed to prepare a business plan for the next, let's say, 10 years, costed it, and we find the money for GMPC to go and fend for itself so that we take GMPC off the national budget. We've been giving them a lot. I mean, in the last, in the first budget when we discovered oil, we gave GMPC half of that money. And I don't know what you call enough because since we started producing oil in this country, which was in 2010. The revenue started coming in in 2011. 11. And what GNPC has gets half. What has accrued? GNPC gets half of that money. It does not get half of that money. GNPC gets 30% of that money. A third of that money. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what has accrued so far to the country is 3.2 billion. 3.2 billion. GNPC has gotten only a third of that 3.2 billion. One GNPC billion will need much, much more to finance its equity and to increase its level of exploration works. And therefore, we need to get the National Oil Company to come up with a business plan so we find a way of financing that business plan once and for all so we can continue focusing on other social investments. But since you have been researching into that, you say they come up with a business plan. How do we finance them once and for all? How much, for instance, do you, if, if you know, would be appropriate for the GNPC? So they're taking off, and then we have you know, uh, the oil revenue to ourselves to use for other things. Um, I cannot tell you exactly how much GMPC will, will, will need, but then I have had the opportunity of being in Malaysia mm -hmm. and studying the Malaysian model. What the Malaysians did was to find money for the national oil company based on its business plan and allow it to go out there and compete. In doing that, you try to find ways of insulating the national oil company from external political interference. So for instance, um, the Malaysian oil company, the national oil company, that's uh, Petronas, does not have to go to parliament to seek parliamentary approval for anything it wants to do. And so it operates according to the rules of business. Its decisions are motivated by pure commercial uh, considerations. In this country, 
we decided we wanted to bring in car power ship. We arm twisted GMPC into providing guarantees for that deal. Who arm twisted GMPC? Well, it was government. Initially, GMPC was reluctant. The business case that is made for that deal, that arrangement where GMPC provides guarantee, and that is to supply fuel for car power ship, is an afterthought. Initially, when GMPC was asked to provide guarantees, that was not part of the discussion. So I'm saying that there's too much political direction and interference in the affairs of that entity. And we need to find a way to insulate the entity from these kinds of That's the way I want you to tell me. How do we insulate it? The way you do that is perhaps to dilute the ownership of, of that entity. We've done that with Goyle. We've done that with um, a state insurance company. We've done that to Ghana Commercial Bank. We've floated 70% of our stake in Ghana Commercial Bank on the Ghana Stock Exchange. And so there are shareholders, other shareholders, to contend with when you are taking decisions in terms of how that company is managed. And you're suggesting we do the same to GNPC? What we have done as a country, and it's working for us, needs being emulated in other sectors of the national economy. So we do the same to the GNPC? Yes, that's the point I'm making. And that, you say, would insulate it from government interference? Yeah. But there are other legal issues to take into account. What in, are those in, legal in, issues? The fact that our law placed in GMPC certain custodian rights in terms of our share of the, our ownership of petroleum resources in this country. So if you are going to do a wholesale of loading of government stake on the stock exchange, then there's a way in which you must find to value our petroleum reserves, ones that have been proven and the ones that are, on yet, uh, are yet to be discovered. That would be a very difficult task to do. And that is why I presume GMPC has embarked on establishing withholding companies, establishing the Tradeco or Tradeco, establishing other companies that it can flow shares to, on, um, on the stock exchange to get people to invest in and raise needed capital for the operations of those ventures. Mm. So at what point in time, Dr. Mantia, would you say it would be appropriate for us to say tap into the Heritage Fund? I mean, at what point of our oil life would you say, well, maybe around this time, let's tap into the Heritage Fund? Um, it is not for me to say. And let me You're make kicking the, against it. Yeah, let me make the point yes. that the arrangement that is embedded in the Petroleum Revenue Management Act is one that was arrived at through intense negotiation mm -hmm. and nationwide wide consultations. And so it's a product of a national consensus. And that particular law says that we can, by two-thirds majority of parliament, vote to spend the interest that have accrued on the Heritage Fund after 15 years of its establishment. Mm -hmm. 15 years. We can, by two-thirds parliamentary majority, take the interest and spend. So allow the fund to grow to accrue interest, and then by two thirds majority, Parliament can decide to make the interest available to support free SHS. So that's under the only circumstance under we can spend it? Yeah. You agree with the bill? You agree with the act that says after 15 years you can do so? But what if we were to change it right now and say, okay, there's no longer a heritage fund? Since you are agree, uh, agreeing with the position of the law, would you then support that one also once the law has been changed? I am a firm believer in the principles of democracy, mm. the principles of consultation, transparency, and participation in governance. And that is why I'm happy that as a Ghanaian, I had an opportunity to input into the discussions that led to the creation of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, and therefore the creation of a heritage fund. To the extent that the current government, which I know believes in, 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 the, in the principles of democracy, will go back to the people and allow the people to have a say, even if he wants to amend the PRMA, I think I'm okay with it. And if the people say, yes, let's use the Heritage Fund to fund free SHS? So be it, but we'll live with the consequences. I am sounding a caution because from where I sit, that money is not sustainable in the long term. 
in terms of financing the free SHS. This is Hot Issues on TV3 with me, Winston Amon. Today, my guest is the campaigns coordinator for ISODEC, Dr. Steve Mantia. So, not long ago, the General Secretary of the Public Utilities Workers Union, Poo, you know, made some comments about the uh, proposed privatization of the electricity company of Ghana. He says government should take a second look at it. But the question many of you have asked is, well, we thought that Ghanaians were in support of a privatization. Ghanaians had felt that the electricity company of Ghana wasn't doing so well. And so bringing in the private sector would help it, you know, achieve that optimum best. Well, Dr. Mantia, should we still go ahead with the privatization in its current form? No. Why? Because privatization has never in introduced efficiency in this country. It has never resolved the problems for which we privatized state institutions mm. and so and let me make the point that it, this, this is not to be taken as a blanket opposition to privatization there's a particular form of privatization that delivers results and I must acknowledge that that type of privatization is the one that offloads ownership to Ghanaians on the stock exchange and so you have a situation where 70% in Ghana Commercial Bank is owned by Ghanaians and 70% of the profit that is made in, this, in, in Ghana Commercial Bank is retained within the economy. The other 30% is owned by the government. That is also retained within the economy. If it's about raising finance for operations of an entity, I'll tell you what, the stock exchange have proven capable of delivering. SIC stocks, that when it was offloaded on the stock exchange, was oversubscribed. Ghana Commercial Bank was oversubscribed. Goyal oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. And so we are able to raise the finance. If it's about accountability, then AGM arrangements within the corporate governance uh, sphere is also one thing that has proven very efficient and potent in delivering accountability. If it's about management efficiency, of course, here again, when shareholders meet, they can decide to change management if they think management is not delivering. So there is a way in which you can get efficiency through a particular type of privatization, which is privatizing to Ghanaians through the stock exchange. But ECG is not going to be sold. It's only being given on a concession. That is semantics. What is semantics about this? Semantics is about it is that the World Bank itself defines privatization to include leases, outright sale, and build, operate, and transfer and other forms mm -hmm. that actually alienates the owner from ownership of assets for a period, in the case of ECG, for up to 25 years. And that is why when you and I, we, we lease land, when we, we say we have bought land, natural for what it means that we have leased land, but why do we say we have bought land? Because it's a form of privatization. At least for a certain period, you are divulging yourself of ownership of that asset for the stated period in your lease agreement. Yes, but 25 years, what's wrong with that? 25 years to bring efficiency to uh, ECG, what's wrong with that? There is no guarantee. We have done something similar in the water sector. We brought in Aqua Vitens Rand. That one was even just five years. Mm -hmm. It failed. Assuming we had tied ourselves to acquire the tense run in for 25 years, what would have happened? How do you get out of this? And so that's why we're saying that if for nothing at all, we should go for a shorter period. If we think that we are committed and we cannot turn back, let's limit the period to which we are going to do this gamble. And what will be that period you propose? Not more than two years or maximum five years. Five years? Yeah, as we did for the water. Are you happy and with... Let, are you happy? Yeah, go ahead. You're making let's a point. put in a clause. If it doesn't work, we pull out. Are you happy with ECG in its current form? I'm not happy with ECG in its current form, but I don't blame the current management. Why don't you blame the current management? We need to look at the problem facing ECG today. Mm -hmm. It's lack of financial resources to invest in equipment and the tools that they need to be efficient. And the bulk of the resource that they need is owed by government. So if, for instance, government uses electricity and does not pay, how does G, uh, I mean ECG get the money to finance its operations? If government introduces subsidies 
and does not pay ECG the subsidies? How does G, uh, ECG get the money to operate uh, finances operations? This is how come G, um, ECG has found itself in the situation they find today. So government is the one to blame. But nobody is making the argument that government should be privatized. And so the point I make is that if the thing is broken, let's fix it. Let us not get rid of it. But why is it that all of a sudden when ECG, I mean, when there was talk of privatization, they went about, you know, uh, disconnecting people and, you know, getting these revenues back. That's clearly an indication that if they wanted to do so all as well, they would have done it. They didn't have to wait for talk of, uh, you know, privatization before they start doing all these things. Were they not asked by government to halt their activities when they started disconnecting educational institutions that owe billions of cities? They were asked by government to stop. And yet, government is not ready to make good amount of money owed to ECG. Again, I looked at some of the transaction documents around this um, uh, concession arrangement, and government has pledged to settle all ECG's indebtedness before the new company takes over ECG. If you are prepared to do that for foreign investor, why don't you do that for your own company and make the company efficient? If government does that, you're sure ECG will be very efficient? Of course, ECG has always done what it has to do. Let's, let's be mindful of the fact that ECG is not a profit and it's not meant to be a profit-making entity. It's a social service they are delivering. At least they must be able to break even, yes. But then profit is not the overriding consideration in the functions of ECG. It's a business, isn't it? It is a business. And that's so they why must I say, make profits? No. You see, you don't treat public goods, water, electricity, health, as if they are commodities to be treated for profit. Then in that case, you don't blame government if government doesn't pay also because uh, they're not to make profits. No, I'll blame government. I'll blame government. But they're not supposed to make profits. Government? The ECG is not supposed to make profits. Yes, but it should, it's supposed to break even. And if you break even, you'll be able to sustain Maybe if they operation. deal with power losses, they would break even. No, they won't. In fact, the operator themselves, I mean the uh, transaction advisor. If they indicated. deal with operational losses, they would probably break even. No. Government, in fact, the, the bulk of the money they are losing is owed by government, not the revenue losses. And so you deal with the losses. If you want to deal with the losses, you need up-to-date equipment for you to be able to deal with the losses. How do you get the money to get this equipment in? But how do you convince many Ghanaians who think that ECG should be privatized? I mean, ASAP Pirates investigation says, I mean, more than about 60% or so of Ghanaians uh, support the privatization of ECG. That's a Ghanaian talking for you. Need I convince Ghanaians that is a bad idea. I'll point to Aqua Vitens run. It's similar to what we want to That's do. That's one ECG. example. Yeah, it is one in that example and enough to guide us in how we treat ECG. What of the others that are doing well? Okay. I will cite Vodafone. Because it's been cited a lot of the times as one of the companies that is doing well. And I'll tell you that Vodafone is, Vodafone is making losses. It's struggling. It's only being supported by operations in London and elsewhere. What's the basis of your argument? Check their uh, balance sheet. You are saying it. Tell I'm me. telling you they are making losses. I don't have the balance sheet in front of me. Right. I also don't have it now. But, but you have seen it. I ha I and you're I making a point out yes. of it. The so last time I checked, it. that was about three, three, four years. I can't give you figures. But then I challenge you, and you can go check it. And I didn't know, US, I didn't know US, we were yes. going to discuss Vodafone here. You, you brought it up. And yeah, I brought it up. Yes. And I'm, saying, I'm making the general point that Vodafone is not doing that well. It's struggling. To, uh, to stay up um, um, with, with the competition. And if you don't believe it, you can check it. I've given you the reference. I say the balance sheet is there as a reference. Go check it and say I'm lying. Dr. Manteo, uh, there's a talk of uh, you know, uh, moving the GNPC headquarters to the Western region, something you support? No, no, no not at all. Why? Um, why do we want to do that? Why shouldn't we do that? Is it in response to agitations from the region? That's where the oil is. Fine. And what advantage does it give the people of the Western region? So you should be telling me. Relocate GMPC today to the Western region, together with all its workers, mm -hmm. and you'll be compounding an already bad traffic situation. How? Because all the workers at GMPC, I bet you, at least more than half of them will drive. Mm -hmm. Already there's a traffic problem in Takoradi. Add GMPC to it, and you are compounding the so bad situation. So that calls for a development of the Western region. That in itself would serve as a basis to take further developments to the region. I think what the people of the region are asking and, for mm -hmm. 
is not a symbolic gesture. They are asking for an equitable share of the benefits of resource extraction. They provide gold, timber, diamond, uh, timber, oil, etc. There are revenues being generated. In the resource allocation process, that's the budgeting process, they want an equitable share of the dividends of oil extraction. But don't you think if they are I mean, closer to the people, it would bring equity in there? They're GMPC to, is not on, responsible. They are closer to the people. There are lots of people who will be coming into the Western Union to deal with GNPC in there. That in itself would boost the local economy of the area? No, it will, it will make things rather worse. Because How would it make things already worse? Already I know rents are on, on, on the increase in, in, in the Western region. And I don't see how bringing people with regular predictable income into the region will, 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 will help them. It will rather compound a bad situation. There will, in, fact, in fact, there will be extra pressure on social facilities. These people will come with their family. The children will go to school. You need more schools. They will fall sick. They will go to hospital. You but need investors more hospitals. will build that. So that in itself is going to be forcing development into these areas. The moment, you need, the moment you need more hospitals, you need more schools, then government would have to take these things there, and that will be opening the place up. That will be, and, you know, that will be growing the local economy of the people. No. You don't have control over what investment decisions investors make. So you cannot expect that by relocating your national oil company there, investors will follow you. Indeed, the Tal Talo Oil, which mm. is the lead operator in the Jubilee field, is located in Accra. Yes. There is reason. Because the NPC is here. No, because if there is any gain mm -hmm. to be made by relocating to Takoradi or wherever in the western region, Talo will be first to do that. But you let GNPC move there, and you see how many, all of them would also get there. They won't move. GNPC moves there, the others will remain here. They want to stay close to Petroleum Commission. They want to stay close to the ministry. They want to stay close to the port. They want to stay close to the international airport. In fact, business thrives on the availability of can't, these can't infrastructure. Can't we have all these infrastructure in the Western region? Are you going to have an international airport so that the people of, um, um, of, 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 of let's say, Talo or GMPC workers, when they need to fly, they can fly from Takradi to wherever they want to go? Why not? People from Takradi would also want to fly. So do that first. So that's the basis. So that's why those who support the, the relocation says that would serve as a catalyst for development in the Western region. I have a different opinion. I think that we should be, sh we should be spending a greater share of the oil revenue on the region. But Dr. Steve Mantia, let me say that's been very grateful that you join us. Uh, have you by chance changed your mind on the Heritage Fund or you still stand by it? Um, I stand by the arrangement, which is a product of a national consensus. Okay that we should have a heritage fund that puts away 9%. Until we, as a people, change that consensus, I stand by it. Until we change that consensus, you stand by it. What that means is that if we decide to change it, you're all for it. Dr. Steve Mantia, Campaigns Coordinator of ISODEC, thank you very much thank you. for joining us this afternoon on Hot Issues. And of course, thank you also for watching us this afternoon on Hot Issues. My name is Winston Amwa. Make sure you join us same time next week. Have a lovely weekend. We're out.